I'd like to introduce our presenters, Jason Geary, who is the manager of the Blendon Center. And with Jason, we have um, Kathy Skinner and Paula Hennessy, who are both accessibility advisors working in the Blendon Center as well. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Joelle. And I'll just go ahead and share my uh, share my slides. I put a link to the slides as well. If you wanted to follow along at home or download them to your Google Drive, uh, feel free. And once I get a thumbs up from my colleagues, I'll go ahead and proceed. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we're we're great to uh, we're grateful to be here, and and thanks for. Uh, thanks for attending. It's actually uh, interesting. I'm sure it's not by accident, but we uh, we directly follow the the plenary that just occurred that um, where uh, Dr. Watson walked us through uh, some engagement around uh, exactly what we're going to talk about today. And, and we're hopeful that this is a, a great addition to that and we can continue that conversation about, um, you know, what we what we did throughout the pandemic to uh, support teaching and learning here at Memorial. Uh, so, um, Again, uh, as Dr. Rodway said, my name is Jason. I'm a manager of accessibility services here in the Blunden Center. Uh, I have Kathy uh, with me today, as well as Paula, who are both accessibility uh, advisors, and we're so happy uh, that you could join us. Um, Dr. Rodway mentioned this as well, but just wanted to highlight some of the accessibility features if you're not aware of them already. Uh, this will be recorded. Um, the slide deck is available uh, in the chat there. and. Um, for those folks that come in later, uh, Michael will go ahead and, and post that in there again. Uh, the captions are available um, by following uh, the directions here. And also, if you want to follow along with a transcript uh, or highlight, uh, feel free to, to do that as well. So this guided discussion um, really is meant to highlight uh, and, to, and to give you all the floor to talk about uh, what it is that you did and what your colleagues did um, during these last two years, uh, we, you know, here in accessibility services, we were, I think, uniquely positioned to hear some of these wonderful, uh, accessible, new for some folks, new ways of, of teaching and learning. Um, and so we're, we're happy to, um, give you all the floor today to highlight some of the things that you, um, that you've seen and that you've done yourselves. Um, we're going to do that through uh, a number of different ways. We're going to have, uh, obviously we have the chat, uh, feature today. Um, and we're also going to have two small groups, so two breakout sessions, um, and we have some questions uh, that we will um, we will put in those uh, breakout rooms to just get you thinking about and talking about uh, what it was that um, you've experienced over these last two years. So we'll do small groups, breakout sessions where you can discuss um, and just whole group reporting. So we'll come back together. Uh, folks can can talk about what they uh, what they uh, discuss in their groups, or you can feel free to to capture those thoughts in the in the Google Doc. Um, or you don't have to do any of that. All kinds of flexibility here. So uh, hopefully you enjoy those activities. Um, and then we'll have a kind of a, a wrap up or reflection at the end um, to kind of talk about what's next. Uh, where do we go? Uh, where do we go from here? So just a brief introduction to you know why we landed on on this topic and and why we felt it was important uh, and why us. Uh, so as I said, I, I think that in in um, accessibility services, uh, we were uniquely positioned to hear about a number of uh, a number of wonderful things that were happening across the institution. Uh, and so we had colleagues reach out and say, "I'm thinking about doing this. Is this a thing? Should we try this?" Um, just to be more accessible uh, to any number of students, not just students with disabilities, of course, but um, acknowledging that there is, you know, kind of no average learner, and and students were of all varieties and types were were struggling. So um, we think we're uniquely positioned to kind of highlight uh, this session today. So we're we're happy to do that. Uh, and of course, you know, back in uh, March of 2020, um, I had here almost overnight, but it wasn't almost, it was overnight. Um, things that mattered, um, you know, for our purposes, teaching and learning, things that mattered in teaching and learning uh, didn't quite matter anymore, or we had to think about them differently. And we, we were forced again uh, overnight to think about how we do this. 
Um, and so this really um, is a session that can highlight uh, some of those things that you all did differently. Uh, and I've seen some of the names and, and faces in, in the room today. So I'm so glad you're here and, and hopefully you um, you can share with your college uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, Brian talks about in a, in a, in a blog post about um, about the changes that they've experienced in the last two years, talks about this existential pedagogical changes that have occurred. Um, and so uh, we're hoping that we can hear um, about your experiences today and, and you share uh, some of those experiences uh, with your colleagues. Um, the other the other thing that we know um, is that some of these things that we did in our in our teaching uh, were innovative and some of them were not very innovative at all, but they worked um, and some of them were really creative and some of them were not creative at all. Um, and we want to hear about all of that and we hope that you um, you share uh, your creative and non creative and innovative and maybe not so innovative um, approaches that you took throughout the pandemic. And finally, I guess before we dig into the discussion about this, we we want to kind of define um, define snapback. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to my colleague Paula, who will just kind of introduce this idea that's been that's been captured uh, around discussions in higher ed around um, snapback. So Paula, okay, thanks, Jason. Welcome everyone, and again, thanks very much for your interest in showing up today. Um, in terms of the snapback, it very much is like a rubber band, isn't it? You can stretch it so far and then it kind of pops back on us. Um, there are two kind of references that are available and included in this presentation, and that'll be um, toward the back of the, the slide deck. Um, in terms of returning to a previous pedagogical practices, um, I'd like to highlight first that pedagogy is sometimes, maybe more than sometimes, confused with curriculum. Um, I'm looking at it and we are looking at it in terms of how we teach the theory and the practice of education and the links between the many different types of pedagogies, which we aren't going to get into today, um, and the links between those course objectives, how course objectives inform evaluation, um, different kinds of strategies, um, pedagogical approaches, and how students then translate that into their learning, okay? So with COVID and the pandemic, um, we experienced uh, a new normal um, in which we looked at things differently and there is, I guess, a risk of returning to previous practices um, akin to as we did it before. Um, certain examples could be in class and on campus courses, um, primarily time tests and exams, no or limited access to class notes or slides without formal accommodations or uh, limited access um, to textbooks and things like that virtually. Um, access to hard copy textbooks only is another way um, of looking at a return to normal. Um, so the norms of practice um, do tend to come snapping back in some sense, I guess, depending on people's perceptions and view of what are normal or typical or acceptable teaching and learning practices, okay? And that is couched within your different pedagogical viewpoints that you have, okay? And your previous experiences and practices with course objectives, defining those, the different types of evaluation strategies that you would have used in the past and how that kind of fits into your whole uh, implementation of the course and the objective and your evaluation as well, okay? So the, tap, the snap back itself, if we look at specifically the defining it, is the tendency to lose sight of the amazingly creative and innovative practices that we have relied on during COVID teaching experiences, okay? And there are a number of different types of approaches 
that we have initiated during COVID. And um, Kathy and I now are gonna move on and share some of those kind of unique things that we have certainly discovered in our role of um, accommodation advisors um, in working with students that have different needs and the need for accommodation as well. Yep. Do you want me to start off, Paula? Sure. Sure, okay. So yes, when all this started, we moved fairly quickly to taking everything that was on campus and how are we gonna do this remotely? So of course, video, audio recording of all lectures started to happen, uh, providing copies of notes and slides to all students. So we support some students for that as an accommodation, but all of a sudden all students were getting, getting those things, notes and slides. And, and we heard back from students quite a bit about some of the things that were happening in the class. And so students that normally wouldn't have had that as an accommodation, they loved it. They loved that opportunity to have a full set of notes and, and full slides. There was also a lot of uh, planning for and adjusting for students who were missing classes. There was a variety of reasons for that. For some students, it was just, you know, access to the internet or spotty internet or lack of equipment. So things like that. There was a, a less of a reliance on hard copy textbooks and, and more reliance on open education resources. Um, Paula, I'll let you keep on there with the last three. Yes, of course. Thanks. So, looking at uh, adjusting pedagogy to support students in different time zones as well. And um, in particular, looking at how online and incorporating pedagogy online was looked at. And I think if we can reflect on for those of us that are not as fluent in online teaching and learning newer to it and perhaps feeling very inexperienced with it at the start of COVID. There was a very quick and steep learning curve how to incorporate um, technology with your pedagogy and how you're presenting your course outcomes and opportunities for students. So things that we are even doing in this session now having the opportunity for small group discussions, for example, and then coming back and having a larger group report are things that um, many of us who aren't experienced with it and have not had the experience of online courses before, this would have been new, quite new actually. And for students um, getting used to what it's like, who would have normally have taken certain types of courses on campus and perhaps couldn't have imagined how am I going to be doing certain types of courses like science courses, math, statistics, psychology, on and on engineering courses and getting the information in a way that I'm used to getting it maybe previously. Okay, so there's that part of it. Um, with online learning, it was much easier to be able to have a distinction between synchronous and asynchronous to have recorded um, lectures available for students who are half a world away from us, maybe 12 or more hours time difference, for example. Okay, um, another thing that I have heard quite often and uh, students and some instructors and faculties that I've spoken with myself have started to discover or rediscover if they have already been versed in it some way um, is universal design in learning and incorporating frameworks with that as well to guide teaching. So things like that, um, having opportunities to provide, for example, recorded lectures, um, access to slides and presentations, um, looking at different creative ways to engage students online, whereas the thought was that could be more easily, more readily, more appropriately, maybe, done on campus um, in the classroom. 
So those types of things considered universal design in learning support all students, not just students who have particular diagnoses or disabilities or exceptionalities. Okay. UDL in and of itself is a really great way to level the playing field while also looking at and maintaining um, academic integrity, for example. And I guess in all of that, it is looking at how do we maintain a high level of um, implementation of teaching and learning and evaluation practices in this new world of COVID. Okay, so UDL is not intended to replace um, formal accommodations. It is meant to kind of um, put students on a more equal footing, so to speak. And then for students who do require formal accommodations, that could be in addition to any standard UDL practices that we have made maybe discovered throughout this process. Um, another way that we responded is um, increasing the flexibility with assessments. For example, more time for all students as opposed to it only being a formal accommodation. So the idea of opening up a quiz and having it available for a period of time, 24 hours, six hours, whatever it is, and students can go in on their own schedule and be able to complete it within a time period, for example. That was a great um, and very well received um, kind of way that instructors and faculty responded for students that was quite helpful, okay? So there are many other um, types of ways that we all responded creatively and innovatively. And uh, we thought in presenting some of these ideas, it was a way to kind of get our thinking hats on. Um, moving on to the discussions now, it's hoped that we'll be able to continue some of the discussions around what did we do differently immediately into COVID that maybe was a little bit of a struggle in the beginning in terms of mindset. Can this be done? Should it be done? Does it meet academic integrity? Are there any concerns that we should have about that? And then now looking, are we potentially snapping back to some of our former practices without necessarily realizing how important and helpful certain new strategies have been? Thanks, Paula, very much for that. Um, so this is our first opportunity for folks to get into um, into their breakout uh, rooms. So I'm going to go ahead and do that uh, do that now. Um, so just before we before we uh, get you together with your colleagues, um, we've got a a number of questions here, and these are um, these are linked to. Um, to Google Docs that will post um, will post these uh, links in the chat, and we'll also post them in your breakout rooms. Um, just to get you thinking about, and you don't have to stick to these, um, but this is just something to to get the conversation going. So um, feel free to to answer those or to not. Um, there's also some flexibility in here and how you do this. So if you just want to have a discussion uh, with your colleagues in your breakout rooms, that's wonderful. Uh, you can also uh, go into the Google Doc. There's one Google Doc for for this uh, for this session today for this first discussion, and just go in and answer. So we've taken these questions, we've put them in the Google Doc, um, and as folks add information to the Google Doc, um, we'll see the this information. Um, collect here. And then the nice thing about this is you can uh, download this to your Google, Google Drive and take it with you when you leave today. So uh, uh, a bunch of choice in there, how you navigate these breakout rooms. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, create these breakout rooms. So hopefully uh, you are familiar with these. You'll um, you'll be pushed out uh, momentarily and we'll go ahead and put a link to that um, to that first Google Doc uh, in the chat and um, you can start your discussion with your colleagues.
So we're going to give you uh, five minutes for this. Hopefully that um, hopefully that's sufficient. We want to we we know we uh, uh, we want to make sure that we get through everything. So we'll um, we'll allow for five minutes. We'll also give you a reminder um, uh, with a minute left, and um, this should be it. So we'll go ahead and open these breakout rooms, and we'll uh, we'll push that uh, Google Doc. Feel free to um, again write it speak it, do whatever you wish. Uh, and I know some of you are tweeting too, so feel free to, to tweet. All right, we'll see you back here in about five minutes. Um, welcome back. So um, I, I know some of you were able to capture some uh, some ideas on the Google Drive on the doc, and uh, some of you chose to um, use the uh, just the opportunity to chat. So I'm just wondering if we, um, and some are still writing, which is great. Um, I wonder if anyone is willing to chat or uh, talk about maybe some of the things that their their group discussed. And I'm acknowledging that that wasn't enough time, um, but in the time that you had, uh, if you were able to uh, maybe share a little bit about um, what you discussed. So feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your camera or not and uh, let us know. Uh, is it Joel or Joel? Either one is fine. Either one is back. fine. Hi, Joel. Uh, Hi. In in my little breakout session, um, I was talking with Carolyn and Terry Lynn about our experiences in trying to bring remote delivery and in person delivery together, and and from what I heard, um, and I think it. It, it corresponds with my experience. I would rather be remote or in person, but not both at the same time, because there's too much multitasking and the time commitment is so much higher um, in terms of the logistics of organizing it and, and, and dealing with additional files and things like this. When I talk with my colleagues in the Department of English about the um, the future that, uh, that beckons, I think the main concern that I have is that we will be expected to do both at the same time instead of one or the other. So as long as we can avoid that future, I think I'm okay with whatever <laughs> future we have. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Yeah, absolutely. For those of us that have tried hybrid or or some version of that, um, it, it does, and, and it's not just that it's more work um, for us as instructors, which I agree it is. Um, I think the student experience um if, if it's not done well can can really um the feedback i've gotten when i've tried it uh is that it, it's not great and so um i've taken ownership in that when when i've tried to do it hybrid or, or do it both uh yeah thanks for sharing that anybody else and and feel free to continue to add uh, information into the google doc as well but anyone uh want to talk about um what their groups discussed i can share for my group jason Thanks, Joel. Um, so there are three people in our group. I'll share three things. One was um, the challenge of um, initiating and sustaining student engagement, uh, even when using tools like small discussion groups in breakout rooms. Um, there was a sense among us that that was definitely an area of challenge in, in a remote learning environment. Another. Um, Another point that was raised was when we shifted to remote learning, the um, professors in this particular group went from having two hour exam time frame to three hours. So the exam still was expected that most students would be able to finish within two hours, but they extended that time frame to three hours for everybody and they've kept it that way, which is something that, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, I think, the, the chemistry group was planning on continuing. Um, and I will say, I find that to be very exciting, this idea of extending what would historically be considered an accommodation to somebody, just recognizing that as being a good learning practice, I found to be very encouraging. And the third thing was the use of submission windows instead of due dates and discussing how um, practically from from a from the instructor's point of view there wasn't much of a difference in terms of 
the workload in uh, around grading, but psychologically for the students having a two week submission window rather than calling it a due date. Um, and this was mine. I, it, I still stuck. I just I, if I wanted something due February 28th, I would put February 20th to March 6th and left it open like that. And they would just come in and I would still, you know, grade them as they were coming in. But psychologically, there was universal praise for that which was a very low cost strategy with high yield in terms of um, wellness, psychological wellness, I think for most students, some students who leave it to the last minute struggled regardless of the submission window, but, but I had zero weight assignments. So those three things sort of extended time, both in terms of test taking and submission windows, but the challenge that we all shared around engagement in remote learning context was, was difficult. Thank you very much. Anybody else have anything to add that they uh, wanted to share that their groups discussed? Okay, so feel free to go into that uh, Google slide and continue to, to add uh, information in there. Um, and I guess we'll transition to our, our next discussion uh, very similarly. Um, so we'll do some, uh, we'll do some breakouts again um, and hopefully it will all go well uh, this time. Uh, and I've made sure that the uh, settings are open so folks can capture some ideas. All right. All right, so very similarly, um, we've got some questions uh, here that you can focus on or not. Um, but we, uh, whoops. But we wanted to um, now kind of pivot and, and look at what we've done since we've come back and, and maybe we've already snapped back to some degree. Um, you know, and I think, um, and rightly so, some of the discussion has been we can't be judged um, by what we did and held to that. And, and Joel, I know you've said like, hey, this was a lot of work and we were kind of forced to do this or encouraged from the highest um, uh, leadership uh, roles in the university to be understanding and be empathic. And many of us just kind of said like, I'm just gonna do it and, and see what happens. Um, obviously going forward, um, not everything that we did is gonna translate into our practice going forward. Um, but what have we already snapped back? What will we likely let go before we uh, transition, you know, back to, to full in-person uh, learning? So just some questions there to, to get your thoughts um, primed before heading into this next um, breakout room. And we'll go ahead and, and push that. So this is another Google Doc. We'll go ahead and push that uh, in a moment when you uh, when you land in your uh, breakout rooms. Um, so again, we'll give you five minutes to um, to have a discussion. We know it's not enough time. Um, actually, I'm going to give you six minutes. So we'll go ahead and start those. And uh, if you could just hit that join link, then uh, you'll meet your colleagues on the other side. See you back here in about five five and a half minutes. Uh, Jason, I'll, I'll share something. If, Thanks, Janet. Um, and this was, we had just started to discuss this before we got yanked out of our room. Um, it's, it's interesting to experience that because I, most of us have been doing it to doing it to students, but it's, it's a different story when you experience it yourself. Uh, one thing that we had just started to chat about was, um, related to that last question. What will you need? Um, and I think it, we, the answer came down to just that. That permission or that that um, go ahead from administration to have that academic freedom to deliver courses how however works you know if we want to have a a virtual or an online class every Friday because it works for the course then it having that freedom would be uh, would be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Knowing that I I don't think we have a definition of hybrid, do we? Not an institutional definition. Um, and it's probably not anywhere in the regulations. So, yeah, interesting. Thanks, Jeanette. Anybody else? Joel, yes, thank you. 
Thanks again. And I've already spoken, so cut me off if you if you need less of me. My comment is in response to the um, question of sharing materials like slides and videos that were captured in class or intended for in class. And um, one thing that I've not snapped back to is my previous um, habit of not letting them see the slides. The reason I never gave slides in the past was that I thought it was a disincentive to attendance. And I've had students tell me to my face, yeah, why come to class if I can just get all the slides and watch the videos? And then they say, and then I don't read the slides or watch the videos because it all backlogs and I can't catch up and I'm really freaked out. So uh, so what I did, and this worked um, when we went back into in-person, I just said, you can keep the slides. I'll keep posting for you, but I'm not going to give you the slides unless attendance is excellent in the class. So, so as a general rule, I want you here and the reward is you get the slides and attendance stayed really good. So, um, so I didn't feel bad about continuing to give the slides. The trouble is for me, like I'm in English literature. So if I'm giving them a document that I'm writing, suddenly I feel like I'm crafting a text instead of just giving a presentation. And so I go into writer mode and then it's a different problem for me. And it's way more time consuming than just preparing some slides that I can show in class. Class and then they vanish into space. Sure. Thanks, Joel. Thank you for that. Anybody else? We have um, Joel, maybe nine minutes. Um, so just acknowledging that. Any any other thoughts coming out of that second? Um, you know the the final question there about what you'll need. It, it's something that I heard in a discussion on Friday. Um, and it acknowledges as, as, um, Dr. Watson acknowledged in the preliminary or the, the, um. The plenary session is this is great, but I'm going to need someone to acknowledge that this is a lot more work and I'm happy to do it, but just how can we build that into, um, everything else that, that we have to do? So what can the institution do, um, to support you in continuing this work? Right? So. Um, Joelle, we're happy to hear from you again. Don't. Don't worry about that. Go ahead. I am keeping time too, but I had a panic because my 15 minute timer, it was just Kathy and I in our group and I could get a tea, but, but quickly, I think, I think it's really important. So I teach online. I I've taught asynchronously online, synchronously online and face to face. These are 3 different dragons. And people just think of teaching in an omnibus way, and that doesn't work. And I think if I were sitting with, I mean, I've said this to Gavin many times because we pass each other in the hallway. I'm like, people are struggling because they don't have the skill set they need to be able to teach remotely or online effectively. The first time I taught online, I told my dean she should give everybody a refund because it was so bad. Because I thought that I just would do what I do when I'm teaching face to face and that's not true. And the saving grace for me when we shift to remote learning was that I had significant online teaching experience. I still had the same trouble with engagement, you know, like we were talking about in our previous group. I still had some of those issues, but others I didn't, but only because those digital tools were already a part of my pedagogical practice, regardless of whether I was teaching face-to-face -face and online. And I think what I find frustrating as an educator is that in conversations, there's an assumed same starting line for everybody. And that's not true. And there's an assumed experience, like teaching, I don't know, 1600 people online, which I know some people do, which just baffles me, but I mean, I guess you just speak to 1600 people. Is that how it works? Like, is very different than teaching a seminar course. So I, I think we need to start differentiating this conversation. What, what, what do we need when we're teaching in this way? What do we need when we're teaching in that way? What are the challenges? But what I do find most hopeful, and I'm totally biased, I have a neurodiverse family, um, is that it's opened up a lot of people's minds about and understanding what's good for some learners is generally good for all learners. And that's my hope that like, I will fight forever to not snap back. 
Um, there's a lot of things that are easy to do that benefit everybody, but have historically been attributed to one population. We're down to five minutes. I'm going to mute myself forever now. So you're the timekeeper, so you keep going. Um, yeah, no, thanks for that. It is something, um, you know, and um, I, I know the discussion around, you know, universal design for learning, universal instructional design, all of these frameworks um, absolutely benefit. And, and that's why I was really excited to do this session, because all of these things that instructors have been doing to support our learners are things that we have as, as an accessibility office have allowed students with disabilities to um, avail of. And we will, after we return to in-person, what, um, what we're really hopeful for is that um, there may be ways to just build in um, those uh, that support for all students. And particularly knowing that, I mean, our office supports, I think in winter semester, 1800 students, um, but we know the majority of students um, just with disabilities is about double that, right? And so these students do, aren't connected to our office or or don't have these formal accommodations really benefit. But it's not just uh, students with disabilities and it's not primarily about students with disabilities. Looking at first generation learners and students who are really challenged uh, with technology and getting access to, to Wi-Fi and, and all of these pieces. Um, so that's um, we're really excited to, to see some of these pieces just naturally being in, included. Um, but just just make sure that the institution is supporting instructors in, in doing that. So we have three minutes um, and I'm not going to do that poll. Um, I'm simply going to allow for a couple of minutes for final thoughts. Um, anything that uh, folks uh, wanted a chance to say, but didn't get it uh, or to have any questions or, or things that folks wanted to to leave us thinking about um, as we uh, as we leave today.